morning. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to church this evening. It's sure good to see all of you here with us tonight and excited to be able to worship the Lord together here this evening. We're going to start by standing and we're going to sing at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Hymn number 29, if you want to look at it in your hymn book, 2-9, or you can look to the screen. Let's sing this wonderful song. Alas, and did my sin. not do that song let's skip that verse not that I don't like that verse but that's the one I wanted right there okay let's sing that one here we go but drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe here Lord I give myself verses than that. Was it for crimes? Let's do that one, all right? You might have to look in your hymn book for this. We can't, we can't skip that verse. The second verse, was it for crimes? Here we go. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned up on the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross Say hi to each other tonight. Welcome each other to the service. find our way back to our seats. We're going to sing this next song, number 310 in your hymn book, Footprints of Jesus. Let's sing it together. Sweetly, Lord. Sweetly, Lord, we have heard the calling for come follow me. And we see where thy footprints falling lead us to. of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. If they lead through the temple only preaching the word or in homes of the poor and Serving the Lord, footprints of Jesus. 
to follow Jesus, I cannot go back. That's a great truth there. Well, let's pray. Ask God to bless our time tonight. For the pain, will you please lead us in prayer? Smiling faces, great. A few announcements, some of them we went over this morning. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, if you haven't joined a small group, be sure and do that. That's a, one of the big first steps around here. And you can call the church or you can fill out the paperwork in the back and let them know on a connection card that uh, you'd like to become part of a small group and they'll get a hold of you and tell you who to get, a, get in touch with or have them get in touch with you so you can do that. And if uh, you're a visitor, fill one of these out so that we can get your name or whatever other information you'd like to have us to have. Turn it in back there, and we'll have a gift for you there at the welcome desk. Also, uh, don't forget, we can purchase the church apparel. we got hats. we got shirts. we got coffee cups. They've got the paperwork out at the desk, and you can sign up for those. They like to have you uh, have that turned in and ready and ordered by the 28th. So they can order them, and after that, they get real expensive. No, I'm just teasing. But they will go up in price, okay? Uh, Sweetheart Banquet coming up next Friday, next Friday, next Sunday on the 14th at 6 p.m., and they got free child care for you who have children so you can have an evening to yourself. Yay! Any parents like that idea? I know we always did. And so uh, you come take advantage of that, and we'll have a great time. The banquet will be at Fiesta Mexicana. Men's Knife Swap coming up March the 12th, and uh, we'll have a good time there. Bring something to swap, guys, and bring a knife, an axe, a machete, uh, you know, whatever you got around the house you want to swap with somebody else. It was a good time last time. They'll have some knife throwing and some axe throwing, and they'll swap stuff, and they'll have food and fellowship and who knows what all else. And it'll be a lot of fun. A ladies' retreat coming up in Moab on March the 19th through the 20th. Ladies, be sure and sign up for that. Let them know you want to go so they can be prepared. And uh, it's $30 for the meeting and then whatever the lodging would be uh, there in Moab. And then Next Step Fellowship coming up March the 21st. And that will be uh, for all those who become a part of our church that they're just not sure what to do next and they're new maybe, well, you come be with us and we'll meet in the fellowship hall. We'll have dinner and have a time of fellowship with pastor and talk about uh, different things about the church and the doctrine and things like that. Gentlemen, if you would come at this time, we will take up the offering. While they're coming, don't forget to pray for Liz uh, Richards. Uh, she, her leg's not healing correctly, so we'd sure like for you to pray for her, and uh, she knows she would appreciate it. Brother Vince, almost forgot your name. <laughs> That's terrible, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Will you pray for us tonight? Thank you, David. It's time we can gather in your house, Lord. I just ask that you would help prepare our hearts to receive the message that Pastor has prepared. Well, I pray you would uh, help him to preach the message. Uh, with boldness and confidence, Lord, in the Holy Spirit, not of himself and, and not of man's ideas, Lord, but of uh, inspired from you. And Father, I pray our hearts will just be open to receive it. And Lord, we pray that you would just uh, uh, be with us now, be with us offering, help it to meet the needs of the church, uh, the missionaries we support around the world. And we give you all the thanks and glory and honor. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
That's a good song right there. Thank you for that. Thanks for playing tonight. And I'm excited to get into what God has for us uh, tonight from His Word. Um, but before we get there, I did, gave the challenge earlier this year uh, to give a but God testimony. And uh, I figure I'll let some one or two of you, if the Lord has put it on your heart to share something like that, a chance to share with the church. Maybe one of the but God moments in your life. Um, I'm putting you on the spot, but if uh, if one of you would like to share a testimony uh, to that degree tonight, uh, or I suppose if you'd just like to share a testimony in general, that'd be all right too. Uh, anybody have a, have a desire tonight? The Lord filled your heart with the desire to do it, to give a testimony tonight of the way God's worked in your life. Yes, Miss Mandy, I will bring this down to you there. Um... I would say May 27th was but God, because um, God made it where I could forgive someone um, that was a very detrimental piece to my past. And when it was presented to me in this action of forgiveness, um, the verse Genesis fifty twenty was what was said by the man that hurt me when I was younger. And so he was on the top of my list to forgive, but had always been very hard because it, when you're 13, you're at a very, very vulnerable age. And the way that the hurt went was very harmful and it was very secret and it Satan was out to kill still and destroy and now I can save both of us and so three days later um, because after that I prayed for God to um whatever he had in mind for my life to let my heart be softened and open to that. And it led us here. So, and my family has benefited from it. It's became full circle because my family and my parents joined the church and a part of my past was there as well. Um, so it was neat to see that we were back home. And um, even this series that my small group is in, it's the Conquer series. And it's like, I have worked really hard in recovery the last six years. And to be even to listen to that video last week, I was like, whoa. I can, but I'm looking at it in a victory way, but I am, you know, there's still areas because the position that I was put in and it has multiple layers, not just from that person, but it's an area that can, it can destroy you. Um, and if you don't ever get help, it, I mean, you can basically, um, just live a destroyed life by it. So I'm very grateful that six years ago, God brought me to a surrendering point in my life. Um, and I just keep working on myself. And I'm glad that my children have been able to watch me work on myself. Um, and then also it's brought me to a place in 2019 to be a healthy person for God to start working on my husband's life. And so a lot of ways, but God has brought full circle and is continuing. I could speak a lot about it, but <laughs> I'm very open to share too. And I just look forward to what God has to, you know, bring from that as well. And the biggest thing is it's never too late to get help. It's never late to forgive. And I mean, just even my relationship with my mom, Satan tried to destroy that too. And it's like, nope, 
just all these victories, so. I'll, I'll just share something that happened in very recent with me in a, but God, um, last fall when we were wrapping up our last small group series, I was, um, adamant that, um, God wanted me to, to step out of leading a group <laughs> and, and, um, and I talked to Berta and she said, oh yeah, I, I would love to take it. And then she's like, oh wait, I have hip surgery. I can't. I was like, oh man. Okay. <laughs> and then, so, um. I stayed, I stayed in it, and then Pastor gave a challenge to all the small group leaders to do this Conquer series, um, the Soul Refiner. And um, our group decided to go through with it, and this last week, we had um, three new ladies, two small groups, two small groups, three new ladies join. And had it not been for God saying, nope, you're going to stay in there. You're going to keep leading or keep, um, not leading, but facilitating this group. I would have really missed out on the blessing of hearing one of our newcomers say, who's been in church all of her life, and she is a senior, um, a senior lady. And she said, I don't think I have ever heard, and she's been in church all of her life. She says, I don't think I have ever heard a sermon preached my entire life until now with Pastor Bruce. So I wouldn't have heard that. I wouldn't have heard one of our newcomers who just started coming um, because of the Soul Refiner series um, share her testimony of overcoming meth by, um, she was sent to the Shalom Ministries um, Recovery Center. And now her brother is in a battle of his life uh, with meth, and we got to pray for him. There was another lady whose brother has fallen into addiction. So all of that to say, I had an idea of what I thought God wanted me to do, but God <laughs> said, no, you're staying put. And I um, walked away with my heart so full, and it's really not about me. It's all the glory to him. But um, anyway, I, I'm so thankful for how he works. When I think I know what direction I'm supposed to go, um, he usually upends me. I love that. Anybody else got a testimony tonight you want to share? All right, going once. Go, oh, okay, here we go. All right, Miss Leanna. I'm coming. It's really more than a thank, more of a thank you than anything. Um, if most of y'all haven't met me, I'm from Florida, so moving out here to Colorado has been a very, very big change. And one of the biggest changes was finding a church home. And the first one was from some lovely people over here, Vince and Therese. They were amazing. And then coming here and meeting the rest of you guys, it's felt like coming home. And that's been really important to me. And so I just wanted to tell you all, thank you. Miss Katie's brother's here with us tonight. So... I'd like for you to tell all the stories about her for us. Can you do that for us? <laughs> all right. Well, I'm sure he's got a lot of them, but uh, we'll, we'll leave her off the hook tonight. So uh, anybody else got another testimony you want to share? I'll give you a chance to do that tonight. Very good. Well, we're going to try to make this a habit throughout the year. And you know what? God may give you a but God moment this year. And it may be something that you just look on your past and realize, man, that was the moment when I didn't even realize it. The whole thing changed. God turned it all around. And it's, it's very neat to look back on your life and, and think about those moments and times. Uh, well, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 tonight. Ephesians chapter 2 in the scriptures uh, is where we're going to be. Uh, we're going to be actually in several places tonight. I uh, <clears throat> told Emily uh, earlier, earlier uh, this week... Um, coming to that point where my mind's getting really tired, so I told her I really need for you to have this baby so I can have a mind break for a little while. Uh, and uh, anybody that's uh, done a lot of preaching, preparing, and things of that nature, you understand what I mean. Sometimes you just need a mind break. And and so anyways, I just don't think that uh, 
Uh, now's the time to hit uh, Hebrews chapter 12. I did study it, prepared a message from it, but I just, I think the Lord has just led me to share something with you uh, that the Lord has really been uh, speaking to my heart about uh, here lately. And, and so we're going to take some time to do that tonight in Ephesians chapter 2. I'll take a little uh, sidebar here and, and tell you a, a praise for the church. Um, I was informed by one of the, the, dear fam- the dear dear families of our church, members of our church, their son is a draftsman, um, and he helps uh, to design the um, uh, designs for uh, uh, for buildings, and he's done several churches. And uh, he reached out and, and uh, told uh, told us that he would like to help uh, make the the drafts for the future buildings of our church um, at no at no cost. And uh, that is a huge deal right there, and it's pretty neat to see God putting pieces together. Uh, my hope is that by this Thursday, um, we, will, we will be able to have said uh, we, we've got the confirmed purchase of our property, um, but uh, sometimes these things get carried on. So hopefully, that's what I was told, hopefully by this Thursday, and so hopefully by next Sunday I'll be able to tell you uh, we officially own the property, um, but we'll, we'll wait and see what happens this week and that, that announcement can come soon enough as far as I'm concerned. But Ephesians chapter 2 uh, is where we're at in the scripture. Um, and I want to talk to you tonight about this subject. And I really believe this is what the Lord wants us to focus on. And the subject I want to visit with you about tonight is intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. Let me begin by saying this. There is nothing more important in your life than intimacy with God. Nothing. Not church attendance, not family time, not ministry service. There is nothing in your life more important than intimacy with God. Now, intimacy isn't a word that we are as familiar with, um, and uh, many times we might have a negative connotation about intimacy or a wrong connotation in our minds about intimacy, so let me define for you what it is. Intimacy, um, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, it's close familiarity or fellowship. Intimacy is nearness and friendship. And what I'm talking to you about tonight when it comes to intimacy with God is being close to God. Spending time in fellowship with God. Being near to God. Now, before we get too far into this, let's just pause to consider how marvelous of a thought it is that you and I, the sinners that we be, can have close fellowship with God. (laughs) That's unbelievable. That I can approach God unworthy as I am, that you can approach God and all of that we know is made possible by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so let's read from Ephesians chapter 2, and beginning in verse number uh, 11. It's what the Bible says. Wherefore, remember, that's a key word, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That position describes where every single one of us are without God. Left to ourselves, We can't have fellowship with God. We can't know who God is. We're sinners born into this world, and we can't have that closeness to God. Being without God in this world, what a desperate place to be. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Isn't that good? Let's read that verse out loud together, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. I just want us to dwell on this for a minute because if you don't realize the value of intimacy with God, and I want you to listen up here, I'm talking up here. 
If you don't realize the value of intimacy with God, you're going to miss it tonight. You're going to miss it. You don't realize how important it is that you can connect with the God of creation, with the God of the universe, that he wants you to be close to him, that you can draw nigh to him. You're going to miss the whole message tonight. So I, I told you guys up there, I want, I want, to, sing, I want to sing that song, um, I Found a Way. You guys remember that song? I want to sing that song tonight. All right? Because really it talks about how you and I can come close in fellowship with God. Now, I may butcher this, but we're going to do our best with it, okay? And uh, so let me grab my guitar. Y'all think we should stand? I don't think so. <laughs> but if y'all want to stand, go ahead and stand. It's completely up to you. All right, let's try to sing this song. Often my heart longs to pray. Think about these words as we sing it tonight. Here we go. Often my heart longs to pray. The sinner, so what could I do?
I found a way. I tell you what, when you really think about that truth, God has given us a way to approach him. That ought to do something for you. That ought to make you want to go spend time with him. He's sacrificed himself. He's died on a cross, been buried and risen again just so you could spend time with him. And you really think about that. The Bible tells us there in verse 11 of our text, you remember this. It's significant that we as the people of God do remember that Jesus has made intimacy with God possible. There's one God, 1 Timothy 2.5, and there's one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified of in due time. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's given us access to God through his blood. And now, the wonder of wonders is that we can approach God without hesitation. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number uh, 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may find grace and mercy to help, uh, and mer- find mercy, obtain mercy, and grace to help in time of need. We can come boldly before God's throne. The point I'm making here to begin is that intimacy with, intimacy with God is possible. Friend, you can be close to God. You can be a friend with God. In fact, God desires to be the closest friend that you've ever had. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, the Proverbs say. And that isn't your husband. That isn't your wife. That's supposed to be God. He wants to be that friend closer than another brother. He wants to enjoy nearness with you. That's why he sacrificed himself so that you could have the opportunity to be close to him. And yet... Though there is nothing more wonderful or integral to the Christian life than intimacy with God, it is sad to say that so many Christians do not have intimacy with God. Let's be honest. So many of us don't have intimacy with God. Would you describe your relationship with God as an intimate relationship? Or is it merely a religious one? Is it merely a formal one? Would you describe your relationship as being intimate with God? When was the last time you spent time with God intimately? When you just spent time getting close to God? Not to check off a list. Then I read my Bible for today. Not to study for a lesson or a small group. I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. Those are wonderful practices. Those are, those are opportunities that, if approached with the right heart, can be times you have intimacy with God. But what I'm saying is so often it becomes a duty and not a delight. If I were to tell my wife we're going to go on a date this week, And then the night comes, we're supposed to have a date. And I said, well, I guess I better go get dressed. we got to go on a date tonight. (laughs) Number one, I'd be in a lot of trouble, okay? But number two, I'm not doing it then out of a desire for intimacy. I'm doing it out of a demand of duty. Like, I have to. I can honestly say that's never happened, okay? But sometimes that's what we do to God. When it comes to our intimacy with God, it becomes a chore. Let me, tell you, let me tell you something. You'd do a whole lot better to throw your little list outside the door and to get back to just spending time with God because you want to be with him. Not against having Bible reading schedules. I'm not against any of those things. They're wonderful. I use them too. But what I am trying to say to you is that God is not so concerned with you getting your list done as he is with getting to know you and you getting to know him. God desires to have intimacy with us and for us to have intimacy with him, he wants to be close to us and he wants us to be close to him. 
I think it's time that we get back to understanding the importance of this truth right here. It's so easy to let empty things fill the place in your life that only God can fill. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter number 3. In a certain sense, we could say that what is happening among the majority of Christians today is the Laodicean disease. Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 14. Do you there say amen? The Bible says, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Notice why. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and read the next phrase out loud with me, and have need of nothing. Knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Hey, the modern day church is essentially saying, God, we don't need you. We can create our own experience that feels spiritual. We don't need God. We can fabricate our own ideology and promote it and make people feel like they're religious. What a despicable thing to have Christianity without Christ. And that's what was happening in this church. And you look at the end of the chapter. Jesus is on the outside. He's knocking. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you let me come in, I'd like to have intimacy with you. I'd like to be close to you. I'd like to have a supper with you and, and you with me if you just let me back in. And sometimes we can allow even our religious practices to keep us from having true intimacy with God. Unless we try to condemn other churches for this, let's look inside of our own hearts. To be honest, I could care less what other people are doing. All that matters when I approach the Scriptures is what's going on with me. The areas in your life where you're shutting Christ out. Intimacy with God, I told you at the beginning, is the most important aspect of your life. But is it really for you today? Is there something else that's more important than that in your life? See, some of us let emotionalism fill the void of intimacy. Intimacy. We don't feel like we can be close to God unless certain songs playing, okay? And I'm not against raising hands. I'll often raise a hand and worship. I don't mistake by my gestures what I'm meaning by this. But so many people think that intimacy with God is emotionalism. Boy, if I'm not feeling it, then I'm not close to God. You know, feelings can betray you. Faith is what's substance. Truth is what's substance. Now, if you are close to God, I think you ought to feel it every once in a while. Don't make any mistake of what I'm saying here. But intimacy, intimacy with God is not emotionalism. It's not, well, it was such a great service and I cried. Why did you cry? I don't even know. And you weren't getting close to God. You were caught up in the moment. I'm not going to park on that really long. But some people... They equate emotionalism as intimacy with God. I'll say this as well. Some of us let intellectualism fill the void of intimacy. You think you're close to God because you know so much about God. Knowing a lot about God has nothing to do with knowing God. All right? I could mention some athletes here, okay, uh, tonight, and some of you could tell me a lot about them. So much so that I wouldn't be surprised if you knew them, but you don't. You can know about someone without knowing them. Intellectualism is not intimacy. Okay? And some of us let ministry fill the void of intimacy. I serve. 
a lot. I do a lot for God. Of course I'm close to him. You can get up and sing. You can get up and play an instrument. You can take up the offering every week. You can lead a small group, be in a small group. You can work in the children's ministry. You can work in the youth group. You can work all over the place for the Lord in the church and not be close to the Lord. Iconic illustration is Martha Martha and Mary. Martha, so busy about serving the Lord, Jesus had to stop her when she tried to rebuke her sister for sitting at Jesus' feet and said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is what? Needful. There's only one thing you really need, and Mary's doing it. She's spending time with me. The dishes can be done later. Okay? We can eat later. But Mary wants to spend time with me. And I'm not going to take that away from her. That's what's important. Intimacy with God. And sometimes you can let busyness, even in serving the Lord, keep you from knowing the Lord. And so we have all these things that try to fill this one void that really can only be filled by us just drawing near to God every day. And Jesus has made it possible for us to do it, and yet we don't. And so, Christian, I want to warn you tonight to beware of the shallowness, or beware of shallow Christianity. Listen, it is very easy to create a persona of being a dedicated Christian. You wear the right clothes, you serve in the ministries, you're at church enough, and you look across the room, and some of you who are newer sometimes may look across the room at other people and think they must be spiritual giants. But you know what's really going on in your heart. It's very possible to be a mile wide and have this big presentation of how great you look, how great you are, but be an inch deep. It's easier than you would think. And God deliver us from shallow Christianity. Why don't we just be what we are? And uh, let God get all the glory. And so we are in desperate need of developing disciplines in our life that are conducive to intimacy with God. And so with the last 15 minutes or so I have here, I want to give you four disciplines, four disciplines that you ought to develop in your life that will encourage you to have intimacy with God, to draw close to God on a regular basis. Are you ready for these? Number one, simplicity. To put it in a verb form, simplify. You need to simplify your life. Number one is simplicity. We are too Busy. (laughs) And our lives are just too complicated to allow for intimacy with God. That's the number one excuse I hear about someone walking with God. I just get so busy. In American society, it's true. This is something we struggle with. Go to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, if you would, in your Bibles. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I'll find it eventually. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse number 29. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. God has made man to be upright. That means... God has, God has made man, but the idea of upright means is God has made man sim- simply. God has made man to be plain and simple. But man has sought out many inventions. Here's how we could define that. We've complicated it. We've complicated it. We've invented ourselves to death. <laughs> I like some of the modern advances in this world, but even taking something like this. So many of you are more intimate with your phone than you are your spouse. Not to mention God. 
Now it even tracks how many hours you spend on it for you. That's like a slap in the face. Let me be honest. We're closer to our phones than we are to God. We've been, we have complicated our life so much, filled our life with so many things that keep us from God. We don't think we have time for him. But what's even more despicable is that oftentimes we don't even think about God. The fool has said, said in his heart, there is no God. We attribute that as the atheist verse in Psalm 14. Sometimes it's the Christian's verse too. The idea that's expressed by that verse is a fool is someone who lives their life as if there is no God. And how many times have you gone throughout your day without one thought of God? You're an atheistic Christian. You don't even think about God. You, you don't even, it doesn't even enter into your thoughts. We're so busy and consumed with the things of this world and the busyness of our lives. Sometimes we're so busy about ministry even that we don't make time for God. The first decision you are going to have to make if you are going to make room in your life and develop a discipline of spending intimate time with God is to simplify your life. It starts with simplicity. And oh, how important that is for us to understand there. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let's go over there, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I must hasten through these, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 3, if you're there, say amen, all three of us, we're there, great, okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, but I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Too often, we are led astray from the simplicity that is in Christ. Jesus defined it, as I mentioned a moment ago to Martha, there's one thing that's needful. In Matthew 6, he said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We think, if we, can, we think that if we could just take care of all the stuff, all the busyness of our life, that we'd have more time for God, but God says just the opposite is true. You'd spend time with me, you'd be surprised at how much those other things take care of themselves. Like what John Wesley said, he was a very busy man. He would travel and preach and sing, and all these things were taking place in his life. And one, uh, one entry in his journal one day said, I have so much to do today that I knew it would not be possible unless I spent the first three hours of my day on my knees in prayer. Three hours? When have you ever spent three hours with God? Have you? Listen, I'm not trying to badger you about how deep your relationship with the Lord is tonight, but I'm just trying to give you a perspective that will challenge your heart when it comes to this matter of spending intimate time with God. God wants to be close to you, but you're going to have to make room for him. It starts with simplicity. The second discipline that you need to develop, if you're going to make room for God in your life, silence. It starts with simplicity, then silence. Psalms 46. Let's go to Psalm 46. Now, y'all are used to staying in one text, and that's where that's my com- comfort- comfortability area there to stay in one text. But we're getting our uh, sword drill in t- sword drills in tonight. Okay, how many of you know what sword drills are? Okay, that's what I thought. Psalm 46. I remember why I don't use paper notes every time I do it. They fly all over the place. Psalm 46 and verse number 10. Let's read the first phrase out loud. You guys ready? Be still and know that I am God. Isn't that simple? Silence. Be still and know that I am God. If you're going to spend intimate time with God, you must be willing to tune everything else out. I had to learn this early on, and I still struggle with it sometimes. But Emily and I are going to spend time with each other. There's a couple things that have to happen, okay? Number one, the kids have to be gone. 
or in bed or muzzled or no, I'm just kidding, but um, <laughs> they, can't, they can't be around if we're really going to spend some deep, intimate time together. The phones have to be off or put away. The TV, off. And it's just me and her looking at each other. It's awesome. You're not really going to spend really deep, intimate time unless that happens. And it's the same way with God. Let me tell you something. You're not going to have intimacy with God. If the times, if the only times you spend with God are with everybody running around and little junior coming up and saying, hey, mom, hey, mom. I, I know moms. I know this is going to be really hard, okay? You're not going to have intimacy with God and sitting in the, sitting in the middle of, a, of the workplace in the middle of the day. You're not going to have time to be able to, to hear what he has to say, with, say to you until you can find a place to be still. And know that he is God. You're going to have to tune everything else out if you're going to make room for him to be able to speak to you. By the way, intimacy is not one person doing all the talking. It's two people talking to each other. It's closeness and fellowship. Right? Now we all know talkers, okay? People who are talkers. You know what I'm talking about? Okay? Some of you... Some of you um, heads bowed, eyes closed. Just go ahead and raise your hand. You're the talker. Go ahead. Go ahead and admit it. There you are. Okay, thank you. All right. But nobody, nobody likes to be around somebody where you can't even get a word in. And sometimes I'd wonder, with the way we spend time with God, be it our, our 10 minute prayer times, God, and we speed off, we speed off, we, we fly off like a speeding bullet. God, do this, do this. God, please this. God, please this. And God's like, ah, Oh, they're gone. I really had something I wanted to tell you. And sometimes I wonder if that's how we treat God in our relationship with him. If you're going to have intimate time with him, you're going to have to tune everything else out and not just be willing to talk, but be willing to let him talk to you. Elijah, in 1 Kings 18, he was discouraged. God brought him out into the wilderness. He saw an earthquake. He saw a firestorm take place. But the Bible says God wasn't in any of all of that stuff that was happening. But then he heard God speak to him. You know how God spoke to him? A still, small voice. And that is often how God speaks. And in the middle of the firestorms and the earthquakes of life and the floods, we've got to find a place to be able to get alone in silence and listen for when God wants to speak. Now, we are blessed to live in Colorado. Finding a place of silence is easier here than you would think. And you can find a place of silence in your home. Jesus said, when you pray, go into your closet. Why? Well, for most people, their closet is going to be quiet. You're going to be alone. I'm just talking about developing these di disciplines of intimacy. First, it starts with simplicity. And then number two is silence. Number three, Solitude. Solitude. Now you might think silence and solitude are the same thing, but just hold on just a minute. Let's go to Psalm chapter 91. You can find a place of silence in the middle of the night, early in the morning, before everybody else gets up. A place of silence is different than a place of solitude. You know, sometimes you just have to get alone with God. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about solitude. And you know, there have been, I try to make it a weekly pra practice of spending moments of solitude with the Lord. Uh, oftentimes it's when I uh, go out and I start walking. There's nothing else around. I'm tuning the whole world out. And in those moments of solitude that I can speak to God, I can sing, I can yell, <laughs> I can talk, and then I can let him talk to me. In those moments of solitude that God often deals with what's really going on in me, the real struggles, helps me process the things that are going on in my life. Now, I, I look at it as, you know, oftentimes some of you might have a good relationship with your mom or your dad, and sometimes you just need to have some solitude with mom or dad, talk to them about all the stuff that's going on. That's how I view what I'm talking about 
and that we're supposed to have in our relationship with God. It's just nice sometimes to get alone and just go talk to dad. Just let him know what's going on and let him talk to you. Let him try to process the things that you're going through in your life. And we all need those moments of solitude in our life that we spend with God. You listen really closely on this. The reason that you are so anxious, the reason that you are so fearful, is because you're not spending times of solitude with the Lord. That is the source of where that comes from. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God, and the God of peace that passes all understanding shall be with you. You spend time in prayer with the Lord, times, times of solitude. That's where God helps you overcome your cares, your anxieties, your fears. What does Psalm chapter 91 say? Y'all are there, I'm not there yet. I think it says, he that dwelleth, is that right? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In the place of solitude, you draw closer to God's presence than any other place. Have you ever spent time with God? And it's just like God was right there. Oftentimes when that happens, God will just fill my heart with a song and I can't help but sing to him. Sometimes I'll just weep, and I'm not a crier. (laughs) You get in the presence of God, and it's amazing to be in his presence. Sometimes I don't have to say anything. He doesn't have to say anything just knowing he's there. That's everything I needed. I can't describe it to you. It's something you have to experience for yourself. If you've never experienced it, being close to God. That's intimacy. And you're not going to get it as closely as you could unless you learn to spend times of solitude with God. I want to dwell in that secret place with the Most High so I can abide under His shadow. You know, to be in someone's shadow, you have to be close to Him. That's where I want to be with God. Nearer my God to Thee. Nearer my God to Thee. Oh, so much we could talk about here. Let's go to Psalm 139. David, I believe in Psalm 139, one of the most beautiful psalms in all of the scripture. He described the, the soul-searching aspect that happens in times of solitude with the Lord. That's what he says, Psalm 139, verse 1. He said, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. He's talking about intimacy here. God, you know me. You know the deepest part of me. You searched me. You know my downsitting and my rising, my uprising. You understand my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there's not even a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together you can you can just you can you can sense the the intimacy that David is describing here that he is experiencing with the Lord boy at the end of this chapter a passage we we love dearly as Christians verse 23 search me O God and know my heart try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting David was having a time of solitude with God here a time of searching, a time of of him seeking God and him inviting God to to search him. And that's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of intimacy that God wants to have with you. We understand God already knows everything there is to know about us. But we haven't even scratched the surface of what there is to know about God. Nor have we scratched the surface of what God would like to make known about us to ourselves. And that comes with intimacy. Intimacy. It comes with that close companionship that God desires to have with us. So you need to develop the discipline of simplicity. You need to develop the discipline of silence. Be still and know that I am God. Develop the discipline of solitude. Find times in your life where you step away from everything else and you just get alone with God. (coughs) And then the last and final um, uh, point to be made here discipline to to develop is surrender, is surrender. 
See, when you get close to God, and while I'm talking about this, let's go over to uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. When you get close to God, through what we've talked about, you simplify your life, you, you take away distraction, you, you clear your schedule, and, you, and you, you make priority for a time with God. And then you get to a place of silence, and even a place of solitude with the Lord. And God really begins to speak to you. When his word becomes relevant in your life and evident in your life, it only leads to one logical decision. And that's surrender. And I get close to God and God says, Bruce, will you stop doing that? Bruce, will you give that to that person this, this week? Hey, can, can, you, can you just cut that out of your schedule this week so you can spend more time with me? When God starts speaking to my heart about those kinds of things, and I'm spending intimate time with him, I'm going to do anything he wants me to do. And that's the heart from which surrender is supposed to flow. So often we think surrender is just something that can take place in a church service, but surrender is something that's supposed to be a daily practice for us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto me, which is your reasonable service. God says, I want you to live as a sacrifice for me. I want you to live a life of surrender to me. And that's the place where God desires us to live. But so often we don't know what we're supposed to be surrendering to because we're so busy about our own will to be concerned with what God's will is. I want what God wants. And the only way I'm going to find out what God wants is if I spend time with him. A lot of times my dad wouldn't tell me what he thought I should do unless I came and asked him. Sometimes I wish he would have told me the better way to do it. It was kind of one of those things where he said, well, you learned your lesson, didn't you? <laughs> yep, I did. God says, you spend time with me, I'll, I'll tell you the way you're supposed to go. What does Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6 say? Trust in the Lord. Let's read it together. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. If you'll you'll invite me into your life, I'll show you the way you're supposed to go. Psalm chapter 32. Psalm chapter 32 and verse 7. I love this. The Lord gave me this during a time of intimacy with him. Psalm 32 and verse 7 says, Thou art my hiding place. There's that time of uh, solitude with God. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. And then the Lord says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Before we came here to be a part of Lighthouse Baptist Church, um, God had been working in in Emily and my heart, uh, in both of our hearts about um, becoming a, a pastor, pastor's wife. And we took, I think it was an anniversary trip towards the beginning of June. It was before Lighthouse Baptist Church had even called us. We had just told our, our, our then pastor in, in Tennessee that God had called us to become a pastor. And we thought uh, maybe we'd start a church or take a church a couple years from then, get trained up and get ready for it. And I remember during that time period, we went on a little anniversary trip to the beginning of June. And I can't remember the name of the place, but it was on a lake. It was a really pretty place, and uh, we got to sit out on the, on, on the lake uh, every morning, and that's where we had our devotions. And I remember sitting out there one morning, and I read this chapter in Psalm 32. And boy, I felt so intimidated about being a pastor. I thought, I don't know the first thing about being a pastor. Why do you want me to do this? And then the Lord brought me to Psalm 32, and he said, Bruce, I will instruct you and teach you. And I thought, you know what, God? If you'll teach me how, I guess I can do it. I'll instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go, and then I'll guide you with mine eye. In that moment of intimacy with God, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Here's the point I'm getting at. If you just spend time with God, he'll speak to you. He'll relieve you of your burdens. 
He'll relieve you of your anxieties. But you're going to have to develop some disciplines to show that you realize you need him in your life. To draw close to him. Draw nigh to God and he will what, church? Draw nigh to you. He's ready. He's waiting. He, he, he shed his blood to make, possible you, for, make it possible for you to have intimacy with him. And it is a great privilege of our lives as Christians to be able to have intimacy with God. And you know, how often we have the Laodicean syndrome. God, I'm good. I'm rich. I'm fine. I got it together. You don't. You need him. You need him. You were made that way. When are you going to allow intimacy with God to be a priority in your life? Maybe you have been growing and spending more time with the Lord in this way. But friend, I don't care who you are. There's something in this for all of us. We'll not be as close to God as we should be till we get to glory. And all of us are a work in progress. And we need some help in this area. Have you allowed intellectualism, emotionalism, ministry to replace your intimacy with God? You understand, preparing sermons... While God does speak to my heart in preparing sermons, that is not my time with God. And it's easy to replace true intimacy with God with something that feels like it. Okay, this is a final illustration and I'll be done. I know I need to quit. But um, sometime, there's been some times for Emily and me, we have gotten real busy. And we'll go visit people We'll be in youth group together. We'll be at church together. We'll be going around and doing all these things. And come down to the end of the week, and, and Emily says, well, I just feel lonely this week. And I thought, well, we spent all kinds of time together. We went everywhere together. But we weren't together. You know what I mean? It's so easy to be busy for God and yet be too busy for God. Not really make time for him. God wants to have daily time to be intimate with you. What a great privilege. Let's not miss our appointments with God. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. We're going to have a time of invitation. It's a very simple message. But what discipline did God speak to your heart about tonight? How many of you say, Pastor, it's that discipline of simplicity. I'm too busy for God. And God spoke to me about that tonight. There's some things that need to go so I have more time for God. If that's you, God spoke to you about that. Would you lift your hand tonight? Just be honest before the Lord. Simplicity. Very good. How many of you would be the discipline of silence? I'm trying to have a talk with God when everyone else around me is talking and there's no room for him to talk to me. How many of it's silence? Let's see. That's, that's what God spoke to me about. Good. What about Solitude. Getting alone with God. I mean, you spoke to your hearts about that tonight. Oh, yes. And how many of you, it's a matter of surrender? God hasn't been speaking to me, calling me to surrender. Anybody like that? Good. Listen, thank you for being honest before the Lord tonight. I want to encourage you, all of us need growth in this subject in some capacity. And I want to encourage you to spend a moment of intimacy with God tonight. Listen, tune everything else out, everyone else out. If you want to come to the altar and do it, come to the altar and do it. If you want to do it in your seat, you do it in your seat. But let's decide as the church tonight to not be a church of a Laodicean spirit and act like we don't need God. We need him. And let's tell him tonight, God, you're important to me. I want to be close to you. You've made it possible for me to be close to you. I'm going to make a commitment in my heart tonight, afresh and anew, to spend time getting closer and closer to you every single day. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. You lifted your hand. Now why don't you lift your heart to the Lord. God's spoken to your heart. Why don't you come talk to him tonight? Spend an intimate moment with him tonight, making that commitment to the Lord. You can do it in your seat. You can do it at the altar. But let's take some time to make this commitment to God tonight.
let's make sure we have time. Amen. Spend time getting closer to the Lord this week. There's really nothing more important than that in your life. I don't care what it is. Nothing more important than that. And so let's remember that as we go through this week. Well, it's been a good day. And uh, sure is good to see uh, Miss Katie's brother Juan, right? All right. Well, I've heard a lot about you, and I'm excited to be able to see you after the service here. And uh, good to have you with us here tonight. Um, don't forget to grab some of these tracks on your way out. Invite people to church with you. Well, we had a lot of guests this morning. Let's just keep it up, church. And uh, God definitely is working in people's hearts. And uh, so grab some of those on your way out, and uh, that'll be a good thing there. Uh, congratulations again to Miss Brittany on a wonderful testimony this morning. I think you blessed everybody uh, sharing your testimony and thankful what the Lord's doing in your heart. Uh, that's such a good thing. All right, well, let's be dismissed at this time then. And I'm going to ask your Brother Bill Oaks if you'll dismiss us in prayer.